Hi everyone and welcome to the internet. So what we're going to be doing in our physics lesson today is having a look at forces in some everyday situations. To start us off though we've got three questions based around our previous lesson so have a go at answering those questions in your book. Let's mark those answers then. So for question one, Newton's second law states that the acceleration the resultant force produces in an object depends on the size of the resultant force and the mass of the object. So give yourself a tick if you got that definition. For number two, the link between force, mass and acceleration is force is mass times acceleration. And finally, for our third question, where we were calculating the acceleration, it's force divided by mass. Give yourself a tick for the rearranged equation. Second mark is for that second line there. So you needed to work out our resultant force first of all. So it's 1,000 minus 200 gives us 800, divided by our mass of 500 kilograms. And then your final answer for the third mark is 1.6 meters per second squared. So add it up and give yourself a mark out of five. So to start off with today, we're going to have a look at this idea of someone jumping out of a plane on purpose through skydiving this time. And what I want you to do is thinking about someone who is jumping out of that plane when they're going skydiving, describe what happens and try to use ideas on forces and acceleration. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a go at this.
So let's see if we've got these points written in our answers then. And obviously mark these as we go through it. So you get your first mark if you said that as you initially jump out of the plane, then you accelerate towards the ground. So one mark if you've got accelerating when we jump. Second mark is for saying that's due to the force of gravity. Next mark is for saying that as we accelerate, the air resistance increases. Next one is until it equals the force of gravity. So when air resistance and gravity balance out or become equal to one another. Then our next mark is for saying that the skydiver will be falling at a steady speed at this point. And the last one is if you actually named that steady speed, which is terminal velocity. So what we actually see when someone jumps out of a plane is initially, then there's very little air resistance acting on them. But we do have the force of gravity pulling them down towards the center of the Earth. So that means they're going to accelerate initially. And as they go faster, what we see is air resistance increases because the faster something moves, the greater the air resistance acting against it. So eventually we get to a point where those two forces are balanced with one another. And then when forces are balanced, hopefully we remember from our earlier work, they fall at a steady speed. And that is called the terminal velocity. So add up your marks there. I believe it's a total of six on that one and give yourself a score out of six. What you've got on the screen here then is a graph showing you how the velocity changes over time with our skydiver. So what I'd like you to do is sketch the graph in your books, first of all, making sure you've got those points A, B, C, D, E labeled on there. And then what I want you to do is explain the shape of the graph. So obviously we just talked about it in basic terms. Now see if you can add a bit more detail to it. And I'd suggest the way you explain it is at point A and say what's happening and why. At point B, say what's happening and why. And so on right the way through to point E. So sketch the graph, explain the shape. I'm going to give you about four minutes to have a go at this.
let's double check that we've managed to get those correct explanations written in then. So at point A, what we've got is gravity is a larger force than air resistance, and so we will be accelerating. So you could have phrased that as we will accelerate because gravity is a larger force than air resistance, or you could have gone with the explanation and said what the effect is. Either way, works fine. Then, because we can see on our graph between A and B, obviously we're increasing our velocity. What we're also seeing is that as a result of that increased velocity, air resistance will increase. So what's going to happen there is we've got a smaller difference between our air resistance and our force of gravity. Therefore, what we're going to see is the acceleration is going to start to decrease. So it's not going to be accelerating at the same rate at all, hence why we get that curve. Point C, where it's that horizontal line, that tells us that the velocity remains constant over time, because remember, horizontal lines on a velocity time graph means you're traveling at a steady speed. So what we've got there is terminal velocity. So air resistance and gravity are equal. You are going to fall at that steady speed. At point D, we open our parachute. We had that label on the diagram there. And what happens at that point is we've got an increased surface area. Now, if we've got a larger surface area, that means we've got more air resistance. So you can see that dramatic decrease in velocity there because air resistance is greater than the force of gravity. So it slows you right down. Then at point E, finally, we've got our terminal velocity being reached again, but at a much lower velocity than before we opened the parachute. And again, the reason we reach terminal velocity is because gravity and air resistance are equal to one another. So make sure you've got those points written down. If you've obviously not got any of those, I'd suggest hitting pause on the video and making sure you've got the full explanation of that graph. So when we talk about terminal velocity, we really need to get this definition in our heads. So this is the definition you need to write down, that terminal velocity is the velocity a moving object reaches when the resultant force is zero. So as long as that resultant force is zero, we have an object moving at their terminal velocity. So make sure you've got that written in your books. Next thing I'd like you to do is have a bit of a recap on some of the work you've done on free body diagrams. So again, taking points A, B, C, D and E in turn, I'd like you to draw a free body diagram to represent the forces at each point there. So free body diagrams for each of those five points, A to E, draw those for me in your books.
What we can see at the bottom of the screen then are the correct free body diagrams for each. So the red arrow pointing down is obviously our gravity and the blue arrow pointing up will be our air resistance. So what we can see at point A we've got a big red arrow but no blue arrow because we've just got gravity at that initial point that you leap out of the plane. Point B then we can see that there's only a very small difference between them because we're obviously seeing that curve. Point C they're equal in size because we've got terminal velocity. Point D, then our blue arrow pointing up is larger than the red arrow pointing down. And then finally at point E, arrows are the same length once more. So obviously give yourself a score out of five based on those five free body diagrams. One thing we really need to keep in mind is that when we're talking about terminal velocity, it's not just something that occurs when things are falling. We can also have terminal velocity for objects that move horizontally, things like a ship, for example. Because remember, terminal velocity is just where that resultant force is zero. So you can move horizontally where your force that's pointing in one direction is equal to the force acting against that motion still going to be moving at terminal velocity. So just jot that point down as a reminder that horizontally moving objects also reach their terminal velocity. Not all of the questions you'll be asked will be nice and simple with two forces working directly opposite each other. If they're going for something that's a bit trickier, then they could give you a force that's acting at a different angle. And in that case, what we need to do is something called resolve the forces. So basically by resolving the forces, what we're doing is making it so we're only dealing with forces acting in two directions at right angles. So kind of question we could get is on the right hand side of your screen there. The angle between the weight and A is 20 degrees, weight is 500 newtons, calculate A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through how we would actually do this question. So when it comes to actually working out this question, then what we need is to first of all, underline, highlight or circle the key information. So the angle between the weight and A is 20 degrees and weight is 500 newtons and we're going to calculate A. So what we're then going to do is we need to draw a scale diagram. Now I have already pre-drawn this one because as we've established from my previous attempts at using this little graphics tablet, then drawing a straight line is certainly not my forte. So what we need to do first of all is we've got to plot our line for weight. Now we know weight is 500 newtons here, so we need to pick an appropriate scale. We're not going to do something like each centimeter is equal to a newton because your exam papers aren't 500 centimeters long. So you've got to pick an appropriate scale here. And what we've done in this case, we've got a bit of squared paper there just to make it a bit easier to see, is that one of these squares is equal to 50 newtons. So if we count up, then that's 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 350, 400, 450, 500. So we've got our line here for weight, which is one square is 50 newtons, so that's 500 newtons going down here. Then in the question it tells us that the angle between weight and A is 20 degrees. So we'd place our protractor along our line here, measure up to the 20 degrees, and then you'd put your little mark. So remember when we do this you kind of put your mark where your protractor is, and then using your ruler and a sharp pencil you come from the end of your weight line and then you're going to extend that down. Now the length of A doesn't really matter, nice and long, it's fine. And what we're then going to do is at 90 degrees, so you can see in this bottom corner here we've got our 90 degrees, then that's going to be coming across 
to the point here. So we're going to be going from the bottom tip of each of those 90 degrees from this down to there in a straight line again. And once we've got that, that marks the end of A. So we can then measure how long this line is and that is then going to give us our scale version, if you like, of what the line represents. And then all you need to do is multiply that length in centimeters by whatever scale we've used and it gives you your answer for A. So what I'd like to do now is thinking about a rocket and we're obviously sending a number of these up into space on a semi-regular basis still. Then what I'd like you to do is explain how does a rocket actually take off? So try to use ideas about forces as you do this. Hopefully, in our answers, we've got some of these points written down. Now, when the rocket is actually ignited, then what we're doing is producing a resultant force that's going to be acting upwards. So we've got a large thrust force. Now, that's going to produce the large acceleration needed to allow it to actually escape Earth's atmosphere. So it's going to have to reach the escape velocity to do this. Now, the way that we can produce that large acceleration is by burning all of that fuel. So where we've got rocket fuel and we burn it, then what we end up with are loads of gases being then pushed out the bottom of the rocket. Now, as a result of that gas pushing out of the bottom, it's going to push against the rocket and the rocket is going to push on the gas. So that's Newton's third law, remember. For every force, there is an opposite force. Now, what we're then going to see is that when the force of the gas on the rocket is greater than the force of the Earth on the rocket, then it's going to lift off and accelerate upwards. So, obviously make sure you've got those points written down. If you've not already got them, I'd suggest hit pause on the video and get those points written down to explain how the rocket can leave our atmosphere. Last thing for today then is the plenary. So those of you with target grades up to a grade five, it's the two columns on the left. Those of you with target grades over a grade five, it's the two columns on the right. So I'm gonna leave this up for about two minutes today, but if you think you're gonna need longer, obviously you can just hit pause and take as long as you need.
As always, you can find the answers to the plenary over on my website, sciencewrite.weebly.com. You'll also be able to find that under the internet tab. Just select the week that we're in, and then you'll be able to find things like the lesson PowerPoints, the answers to the plenary, any additional work, and if there's any little experiments I thought you could do at home, then they're there too. So have a look and get using that.